Join us on Taking Care of Business. This week, I'm joined by our Managing Director, Mark Walters. We're talking all things H1 or half one. Um, we've seen a huge increase of 69% in what we term the ultra luxury market, which is property sales for $10 million um, and above. I think Lewis was on the radio a few weeks back and he, he said we've got a designated uh, group of people now who look after the... Um, Let's say that we call the private office. The Everything that's happened in the property market so far this year, it's full of figures in the tens of thousands. It's full of percentage increases. Just looking at the um, the value of some of the properties that we rented. You know, there's one in there for 2.6 million dirhams in Dubai Hills, one for one, one for 1.4 in Jumeirah Golf Estates. This is, this is absolutely incredible. And again, that's not even mentioned our, our commercial arm as well. 81% increase on lettings viewings, for example, 20,000 units handed over into the market, 50,000 people moving to Dubai, all this and much, much more. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Taking Care of Business. I'm joined by our managing director, Mark Walters. Afternoon, everyone. If you're listening in the afternoon. If you're, if, yeah, if you're not, if you're not <laughs> good morning. Um, this week we released our H1 report for the Dubai property market. You can find it on our website if you want to have a look at the whole thing. But Mark and I are going to do our best today to summarize some of the key points and give um, give some of our opinions on what's happened in the market so far this year. So I'm going to start with some points from, this is from Dubai Land Department data. So this is what's happened in the whole of the Dubai property market in the first six months of the year. Total sales value was 190 billion dirhams, which is a 38% increase from half H1 2023, 7% increase from H2, and total sales volume was 74,467 sales, which is a 36% year-on-year increase and a 17% increase when compared to half two. So same as we've heard for quite a while now in terms of the Dubai market on a continued uh, upward trajectory, really, in terms of interest and transactions. To break that down, um, just read a couple of things, and I'll bring Mark into the conversation. Um, apartments accounted for 82% of the transactions in the market, with villas at 18%. And the value of the market, so apartments had 82% of transactions, but accounted for 60% of the value, and villas 40% uh, of the value. 79% of all sales were below 3 million dirhams. So it's, as we always say, it's the most active, the affordable part of the market is the most active part of the market and 10 million dirham plus uh, 3% change in the market. So from this, we can see that there's an increase in activity and uh, an increase in transactions at both ends of the price bracket. But first question for you, Mark, is are we seeing more first-time buyers in the market? I think so. Um, I think with the way... Rentals has gone over the last, probably the last, well, since COVID, since everything, since COVID, isn't it? You've seen a, a massive spike in prices and people are just, they don't want, they don't want to be paying someone's mortgage. They don't want to be, it's dead money essentially, but they don't want to be paying someone's mortgage. That's the most important part. And I think what I'm seeing as well, Paul, and from a personal point of view, you're starting to see people now who are, moving from the UK. If you'd always remember, we always used to have a thing where people would come to Dubai for two years. Then they would save up. Then they would get a deposit. Obviously, the deposit, depending on whether it was sub five or over five, they would have to spend 24%, 25%, or if it was over the threshold, it would be a 30 or 34, 35%. But now people are coming over for a short amount of time, whether it be a two or three month period. If they've got property in the UK, they're bringing it, they're liquidating from the UK and bringing it over here. And that's what we're finding now. Like I say, personally, I've, some of my family members, they've only been here six months and they're already looking to try and get on, on the ladder before it does get too late as well. Because obviously, in some cases, the prices are running away with people, you know? And I think people feel the excitement of the city. We've got the new airport announcement and everything that's going on around there. But we actually had um, some company meetings this morning and one of the common really themes, I guess, from the meetings was the stickability of Dubai these days and how it's working to become more stickable for people. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. 
Um, yesterday or this week, Sheikh Hamdan announced the Jebel Ali Beach Project, the longest stretch of beach in the UAE. It's all about activity, health, wellness, preservation with the mangroves and uh, nature and looking after sea life. And a lot of the new off-plan launches at the moment really f- there's a focus on greenery, uh, wellness communities. They've just announced um, just outside the office is a, a main road called the 311, a 111-kilometer green corridor along the 311, which is... Um, linking all the communities by a solar paneled metro, but also having loads of cycle paths, uh, pedestrian areas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, we've seen this for the last five years or more in terms of more park areas, cycle paths, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, like you said a moment ago about Dubai, used to be people come for two years, etc. Dubai is attracting people, but now it's really working hard to keep people here for the long term. And it's happening, Paul. You know we. When we have our new starters in, we repeat ourselves all the time. And we are very, very biased towards the city. But I can't, obviously, we go on holiday whenever we go away, whether it be Christmas, whether it be the summer. And no matter where you go, whatever city, whatever place in, in the world that you go, there is nothing that compares with this place. And that's, whereas Dubai 10 years ago was a bit a bit of a, I don't know, obviously not a poison chalice, but it was a place where people are a little bit apprehensive about now the whole world knows about this place. It's all, everything I believe now about Dubai, Paul, is all positive. Like you say, all of these things, all these initiatives that Sheikh Mohammed and, and the government are bringing into place, it's nothing but positive. I can't remember the last time I heard anything negative about the place. You know, you look at, I know touch wood, but you look at, like, I always come on air and say about food and beverage. Now Michelin have come into, 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 into Dubai to just... I think there's around about 24 restaurants now that have, have got Michelin star. Now, I know that's a small thing, but that was never the case two or three years ago before these guys came. You got to talking about the well or wellness, I think, which we'll touch on later on. Dubai now has got the most branded residents in uh, as a city in all the world. I think last year it was, I think it might have been New York. Now Dubai's taken over that, and it's all based around wellness. You look at the new Gaff Woods, you look at... Um, one's a Beal with Ciro, which is a, 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 um, a, not a company, but a, a wellness type of, imp- you know, yeah, you yeah, yeah. what I mean? And everything now is geared up towards that. And it's like for our kids, there's the amount of things that we can do with our kids on a daily basis, Paul. And that just gears up, going back to your original question, why people now want to stay, the stickability, like you said, it's not just a two-year transition period. It's a, now it's 10, we like say, some of our anniversaries today in, in our company review, one girl's been with us 14 years and two of the lads have been with us for uh, 12 and 10, 12 years, and 10 years respectively. Yeah. But that's, they're 10 a penny. That's happening all the time because of these reasons. And the guys we mentioned before, they have children. And, not, and this, obviously the safety factor and everything else. But it's, I can only see that the time shortening, Paul, for when people come over and first time buyers, um, as opposed to like it was 10 years ago. So with all the choice in the market, it seems like there's all the launches all the time, all the different communities that are handed over now. Would you say this is a, a buyer's market because of that? Or is it, are we saying it's a seller's market at the moment? Listen, if you look at the stats, the amount of, I think if we asked all of our brokers, they'd say it's a, it's a seller's market because there's no stock. But you could switch that on its head and say, well, buyers at the moment, if they're buying, I believe, I can't see this market changing anytime soon. Don't know about you, but I just can't see any with all the things that we've mentioned. So you can say it's a seller's market because the well, seller's market, they can dictate the price. But if people are buying today and in six months time, 12 months time, there's some people, Paul, who have bought off us and what we call transferred on the property where it completes into your name. And they bought two months ago and the price has increased by, let's say, 10, 15, 20% in some cases. And they haven't parted any money. So we could flip it on its head and say, well, okay, if you buy today, then your property is going to be worth X, Y, and Z in, in six months' time. So you could look at it that way. But in terms of if you want to label it, it's probably still a seller's market yeah. because, again, it's listings and stock are very, very hard to come by, you know. And, and like you say, people, I said they can name the price, but in terms of when buyers are offering on, on properties, they're tending to go for asking price, if not over asking price. And whether there's a bidding war, there's two or three people 
bidding at the same time. Quite, quite often, I, I know we've said it loads of times on the podcast before, but quite often when there's a vacant on transfer unit as well. So what we mean there's by a that premium is, pool. Yeah, yeah. if the homeowner lives there or if it's tenanted, but the tenant will be leaving so the purchaser can move into the property on handover, we, we term that as vacant on transfer. There's a definite premium for that. But we had a debate the other day about this with, with some of the senior guys and they were saying, listen, beggars can't be choosers. They have some people now have to buy with a tenant in situ because... There's no vacant units available. And that's why going on to, I think you, you were going to touch on the point, properties now that are vacant, that are being renovated, again, fetch more significant premium as well. 100%. Okay, let's have a look, dive into some of the Allsop and Allsop figures for the first half of the year. So our sales volume was up 31% um, against the second half of last year, which seems to fit in with the market. It well, is crazy to think that, Paul, isn't it? Because you look at the year that we had last year, and the fit, especially H1, to have a 31% increase in revenue was just... So obviously, we have our our, our, um, our budget at the start of the year and we have our, our schedules. And for us to, to be looking now at the start of H2, to have a 31% increase is unbelievable. It's quite good. Carl and Lewis, if you're listening on your summer holidays. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then second off, um, we've seen a huge increase of 69% in what we term the ultra-luxury market, which is... Property sales for $10 million um, and above. Now, obviously, I think that's um, an account of two things. One, that is the market at the moment. But two, we've obviously launched a private office earlier this year, and we've now got a dedicated team servicing solely properties over $10 million. So from their point of view, it looks like they've hit the ground running. It is, yeah. And I, I think Lewis was on the radio a few weeks back, and he, he said, we've never not done it. We've always done it. But now it's obviously we've got a designated uh, group of people now who look after the, um, well, let's say that the, the, we call it the private office. The and people, so it's not just agents, but a whole marketing suite behind them as well. So it's That's a, the difference. It's a whole dedicated I think now Paul, people are going to be taking us seriously. And obviously when we do something, we do it properly. You know, you look at the people that we brought into, into the, the team, you look at the new branding, you look at everything that surrounds the private office. It's just slick. It just looks the part. And I believe, listen, obviously we're biased again, I think we stand out from the market. I, I honestly believe that. But like you say, looking at, at the at the um, the numbers there, it's never not been the case. I think last year, we there was four hundred and thirty one properties that were sold over the ten million dollar bra bracket. I think percentage wise, I think we were between eight and twelve percent of that market, which is I think is is really yeah. really good. That's only going to going to increase again with the people that we've introduced and everything that's around it. So. Yeah, listen, it bodes well for, for the guys in our private office, but obviously bodes well for, for our team as well because we have got that. Obviously, we've got the database in terms of we have the buyers on our system, we have the people on our system for this segment. Listen, it's very exciting, this part of, the, of our business. Definitely. Um, let's have a quick look at the uh, lettings side of the business. So I think there's been over 20,000 property handovers so far this year. I think the population's increased by roughly 50,000 um, people. And that's reflected in our figures. So in the first half of this year, we've seen an 81% increase in lettings viewings compared to half one of 2023. Uh, prices have increased um, by 27% across the board. And as we always talk about Dubai, it's hard to just talk about it across the board because obviously it will vary in different areas. But for this, for this purpose, we're talking across the board, an average increase of 27%. And four plus check payments accounting for 33% of all contracts. So roughly a third of tenants now are paying in four checks or more. Yeah, and I think that's been the case for a while. You know, you, I'm of the opinion, Paul, is obviously you want, it's ideal if you get one check, but if you get the price that you want, it's not the end of the world. But I'm touching on, on the on numbers in terms of, of pricing again, going off our, our lettings and sales review this morning, just looking at... The um, the value of some of the properties that we rented, you know, there's one in there for 2.6 million dirhams in Dubai Hills, one for one, one for 1.4 in Jumeirah Golf Estates. This is this is absolutely incredible, and again, that's not even mention our, our commercial arm as well. So some of the figures, and I think our average rental last, I think for H1, was, I think it was around 309,000 dirhams, if I'm right. That might be might might be wrong, but I have to look at that, but. But you're looking at it's a significant increase to to any other um, half of the year, you know, and I think it's going to be the same. Hence the reason going back what we were saying before, prices that the rental side of the, of, of the market is 
it's probably just as prominent as what it is in in the the sales side where there's no there's no listings there's no stock available obviously that's driving the price up significantly well talking about stock we had, we had finton on the podcast last week and talked about a, a number of things but one of the, the points that came out was that this year there's been a launch a new launch every 17 hours on average and i think in the first half of the year i've got here there was forty seven thousand seven hundred and ninety two units launched into the market so we're talking about a shortage of stock now. Are we in danger in a two, three, four, five years when all these um, off-plan launches start handing over of being oversupplied in the market? Um, obviously, there's an argument, and we can't. We've got no crystal ball. But like you mentioned there, it's it's still there's twenty thousand units handed over, and there was fifty thousand units coming. To, people people moving, yeah. coming to country. So we're still way off where we need to be. Now, if that continues. We're still going to see more people come into country than what units are going to be handing over. So all these initiatives, what we're speaking about, Paul, all of the urban twenty forty plan and, and all things like that, um, people are going to more people are going to want a bit of this place. People, more people are going to be coming in country. I think if you look at fifty thousand coming into country, is that an, a, an accurate stat? I think are probably going to be a, a few more there. And over the next few years, Paul, as this place progresses like it is at the rate of knots that it is, that can only, again, it can only bode well for more people coming into country. And again, the answer to your question is, I don't think it will, just because of what they are actually doing in this place. It's second to none anywhere else in the world. So that leads us on to you talking about a rate of knots. So we, it, back in June, um, we recorded the highest ever price per square foot average in Dubai, and it's con which at the time was 1,380 dirhams per a square foot, which continued to rise a bit since then. So that's put us in uncharted territory in a way. How And again, there's no crystal ball, but how much can we keep climbing? Still cheap. I've, I, I can't, I'll, you look at the, the luxury segments of the market, let's touch on, let's touch on what, what would you say luxury segment is? Um, Atlantis, the Royal. You're looking at around about 10,000 dinner per square foot. What's that? £2,200 per square foot. You look in Kensington or Mayfair, the average price per square foot for the property in them um, locations and anything from twenty two to 30000 dirham per square foot. Now, I know every single city in the world has its problems, has its security problems, has its all of these other things, but you walk from you five minutes in, in Mayfair or five minutes in Kensington and you're going to a rough part of, of London, whereas here, Paul, you're on the palm. Security and safety in this place is, I think it was voted the best place, or Abu Dhabi was voted the best place in the world. But in terms of pricing, 1,300 dirhams per square foot as an average. Your highest segment, let's say, is between 10 and 13,000 dirham per square foot, which in my opinion is still very reasonable. But 13... 100 dirhams per square foot, it's what? It's 300 pound per square foot. I remember looking at a property back where I live and it was at 320 pound per square foot and it was in the middle of the city centre. What, trust me, it's not, I'm not saying it's, it's not a bad area, but it's nowhere near what we're looking at in Dubai. So it's still very reasonable in my in my opinion and I think it will go up. I think we will see an increase in... in so some room for growth still, especially with the individuals that are coming in. Absolutely. Again, it's, it's still... Because we've seen it the way it was, let's say, pre-COVID, and the prices were sub a lot of a lot of developments were sub a thousand dirham per square foot. Again, it's it's a what it's a 25, 30% increase since then, but in some cases more. But it's still in the grand scheme of things, in the major cities, in your Hong Kongs, in your New Yorks, Londons, Singapore's, all of these places, it's still very, very reasonable. Agree. Okay, so we've had a look back at the first half of the year. Looking forward to the second um, the second half of the year, putting your, I was, was going to say guessing hat on, maybe that's a bit unfair because I'd like to say, I think we take educated estimates of the market based on knowledge and experience, but what do you think uh, for the second half of the year, any specific areas or types of properties where you uh, anticipate any strong interest or price price changes? Yeah, just listen, uh, there's two areas that I, I'd like to touch on. First of all is, I'll say areas, probably as a whole development, Expo City, yep. up towards that end, with obviously with the uh, 
with the new airport being announced, uh, I think there's 140 billion that's being spent on on that on that area. Obviously, the infrastructure that's going to go into place there. You've obviously got Palm Jebel Ali up towards that end. You've got um, obviously the new airport. I'm excited to see that area. I really, really am. And I don't know whether you went. To, I think you went to to Expo. Oh, we had a great time up Which there. Superb. Yeah. When I went there, obviously it was it was a bit different because it was more it was more uh, fun. But I just thought this. And when you look at commercial, we, we mentioned it before, you look at commercial, there's no commercial at the moment in, in Dubai, any commercial launches. That place seems to be, looks like it's going to be the hub. I think the trade center is going to move towards Expo City. Um, and then obviously you've got all of that area there. You've got Palm Jabal Ali that obviously got um, relaunched at the start of the year. That's something that I'm excited to see. And again, whether it be from a personal point of view, but for growth with our company, that's something that I want to keep a close eye on. And another area we've mentioned a few times is um, Talal Al Gaf, up two minutes away from where we are. We've seen significant growth, not just in our individual, our, our teams in house, but just what the guys are doing over there in my, with Majid Alpha team. It's the price point when they first launched was when you look back now. I know it's you probably argue that with every every single development, but it just didn't make any sense. It was that cheap. And now three of our, our guys, or sorry, uh, one of our departments, the three people in, sorry, the four people in the Talal Gaff team, they were one, two, and three respectively within in terms of um, doing the most commission. I don't know if it's going to stop. That's a team. I think I think there's over, just shy of 4,000 units in, in Talal Gaff. And just to put it into perspective, in the last six months, there's been 415 um, sales. Arabian Ranches 1 and Arabian Ranches 2 have only transacted on 330 um, transactions. So you can see the scope of what Talal Gaff brings. That's not including the, the off-plan stuff in, in Arabian Ranches 3. But obviously, Arabian Ranches 1 and 2 developed, huge mature. Huge, uh, communities, yeah. And again, we've got a team of a lot more than what we have in our Talal Gaff team. So... That's another area. And you look at the, the, the original prices, Paul, when he first launched, double, even tripled in price. Um, well, I think people are looking at that as well. And then I, you, you mentioned before about um, Expo City and Dubai South. These are the next Talal Gaffs, really, because you've got the new airport going in. You've got Jebel Ali Palm. You've got Jebel Ali Beachfront, which 6.6 .6 kilometers, I think, of open beachfront. So you've got all this huge development going into that side of the town. Where there's launches at the moment, that's an opportunity. I, I really believe in five or ten years, people will look back and think, "Oh, if only we had the chance to invest five years ago when the prices were this per square foot, and now they started to hand over. And now we've got this the beachfront, and now we've got this happening, and it's this per square foot." So, I think Talal Gaff is a something that a lot of investors and not even inv when you talk about investors, you think of um, big property portfolio owners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But investors, for the most part, in Dubai, most people who buy off plan with us are buying a second or third property. The people who live here, they work hard, they've got, they've saved and saved and saved, they've got more money to spend, then they invest into the, the property market. These are the kind of case studies and examples that, that are being looked at. Do you remember probably like three or four years ago when people were balking at like Town Square, Amira, Amira Oasis, even Arabian Ranches 3? If you look at the amount of people now that are buying in them sorts of areas, Paul, last month, again, I don't want to, dive in too much about what our guys do in terms of what they sell. But our town square guys, that was never heard of the amount of, of um business that that business that they were generating. Nothing's far no more. Yeah. You know, nothing is far no more. You where we live, it was like that was it was like it was miles away. But now it, it's it's not everywhere now because of the infrastructure. You look at the the works that happen in, in on Al Kale, the amount of um what they're investing on the roads in, in Al Kale. It's going to be shortened again, Paul. Do you know what I mean? So all of these areas, you look at the Al Quadra uh, Corridor, what we call it, Damak, Mira, Mira Oasis, Sustainable City, all of these areas, now people are now starting, maybe because they can't afford the likes of your Arabian ranches and all your Emirates living, are going out to more new shiny areas where they are a lot more affordable and you get a lot for your money as well. So it's not just Talal, it's not just, you know, Expo City, it's all these other little areas as well that were supposedly um, quite far away and now they're not. True. Okay, we've talked about sales, we've talked about lettings, we've talked about off-plan, we've touched on the commercial side of things, so I guess let's finish off with mortgages because 
mortgages have been um, flying so far this year. And I don't just mean our team. I mean, well, like the mortgage market in Dubai, so much so that I think that the banks are struggling at the moment to keep up with with the demand, which is, is no criticism of the banks as such. That, that they obviously just need to ramp up now, but... It's been a um, it's been a crazy first half of the year for the mortgage market. Yeah, it has, and it's we've reached out. We've actually reached out to the to the land department to see if they can help us on this. In terms of in terms of lo- uh, prolonging the the transfer dates because banks are inundated. It's great for the market, absolutely superb for that, the market. Not for the poor guys in, in the banks who are you know rushed over under off the feet and I think work until early hours. God sends, but it's in some cases yet yeah, we can't. We can't submit it to specific banks just because they are inundated with cases. So we have to diversify with who um, who we're sending it to. And I think to touch on the land department point you made, and this is for anyone purchasing a property at the moment, or in fact selling to, to a buyer with a mortgage, and whether that be with Allsop and Allsop or with any other agency in the market, sales are delayed at the moment. And it, in a lot of cases, and again, this is no criticism of the banks, it's sheer workload, but it's good for people to be aware of, to factor in, if you're buying or selling at the moment and there's any kind of finance involved, just factor in an extra month into the timelines because with the sheer volume of activity in the market, things are just taking slower to process and slower to get through. And we've seen that and we've we, we done a, a piece with our, our sales guys on timelines. And we're actually sending out anyone who buys a property from us now will get a timeline of what they should be doing because obviously a lot of our buyers don't know the process. So in our introduction emails, now we'll give us a timeline on what they, at what time or what stage they should be at with their mortgage, whether it be a pre-approval stage, whether it be a final offer list, uh, stage, and that will be implemented in, because it's so important. It's like I say, we try and guide, whether it be from our sales agents or from our mortgage brokers, but logistically, especially in the summer, in some cases, there's four people in a transaction Nine times out of ten, there's going to be someone traveling, so we have to factor that in. So like Paul said, just make sure that you're speaking to your broker, make sure you're speaking to your your mortgage advisor, more importantly, just to get guidance on timelines. I said we'd finish on mortgages, but you just mentioned the summer, so it's quite an apt time to ask you of, I'd say we're only just entering the the summer period, really. Schools have only just broken up, but have we seen so far, and do you expect to see much of a, a slowdown or a dip in the market or business as usual? I listen as as I always say, Paul. As agents, I think it's a mindset. I think there's a lot of people now. A lot more people are staying in country, and you can get more done. Roads, as people have seen with the kids being off off school and whatnot, it's it is a good time. Listen, it's very very hot, but I believe it is a good time to view. Yes, listen, let's not try and pull the wool over anyone's eyes. It's it is will it will slow down because people will generally get on a plane and go home, but it's still always been very good for us. And I think probably that's our mindset, Paul. You know, it's, we try and not take our foot, foot off the gas. And in terms of people um, registering and wanting to go go out viewing, that hasn't cooled down. You know, obviously we do our reports every single week. And in terms of lead generation, it hasn't slowed down just yet. It may do, but at the moment, it's like I say, it's still because the roads are a little bit quieter. Um, people have got a little bit more time on their hands it's still a very good time to buy. And so is a, a big indicator for me because obviously the, the applicant registrations is a lead time to transactions down the line because yeah. it, it takes, depending on tenant buyer exact situation, takes a few weeks from registering yeah. to actually transact uh, on a property. And I think if they've not slowed down, when I, I think I saw in the paper before, we've been over 50 degrees two days this week. It might be the hottest summer ever. So if the, the applicant levels are the, are the same now as they have been before in those kind of heat then suggests the seriousness in the market. I see it in opportunity as well, with people going away. There's maybe where you had three or four weeks ago, there was maybe two or three people vying for the same property. There might only be one now. Um, so I look at it as, as opportunity as well. So listen, whatever you, however people put a spin on, on, on this place, Paul, there's only one way, I believe. And again, obviously we've got to, We've got to be positive all the time, but I just feel like this place is only going in one, in one direction. I do. Just from all the things that we've mentioned and all the things that we're expecting to come up in the next two, three, even 15 years for the 2040 urban plan, it's, it, it, I'll be very surprised if anything changes. 
Good. Anytime soon, anyway. Well, that's a good place to leave it. Thank you, Mark. Cheers, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for... Sorry to talk over there. Thank you for tuning in, guys. As I mentioned at the start, the H1 report is on our website. So if you want to delve into the figures yourself and, and have a look through the report, then please head there and download it. Any questions, any clarity you want, anything, anything you want us to run over again, please let us know. Please like and subscribe in all the usual places. And we'll see you again next week. <laughs>